So we have a new school of jurisprudence. Uh, we have completed uh, natural law. We have completed uh, legal positivism. Uh, we have completed historical jurisprudence. And so we are going to start uh, the next school of jurisprudence, a very important school of jurisprudence called sociological school of jurisprudence. So before we discuss about sociological jurisprudence, let's uh, start with differentiating it with another uh, similar sounding, uh, you know, in, in area of study, okay, known as uh, sociology of law, okay. So sociology of law and sociological jurisprudence, uh, although they have a lot of similarities, but not uh, not the same, okay. So you would see that well, there are many variations, you know, within them, okay, but. Between these two, there are you know, certain differences that that's you know worth knowing. So, sociology of law would be considered as a subdiscipline of sociology itself, okay, which is a social science. Now, and they are concerned with uh, law as a way of uh, conducting and regulating you know human behavior, okay. So, so within that, again, there are many different you know views, okay. Some say that well. It's predominantly about sociology, and you know, like in its periphery, it overlaps with with law, and, you know, legal inquiries. Whereas for others, it's essentially about the law, but you draw methodologies from sociology. And for many others, it's n neither on this side nor on the other. But it's a, some it's something something that is completely new. But that does not matter. Okay, those are you know some other disciplines. Okay, uh, other discussions that we have to. Uh, discussing maybe other topics okay but for um, for now just remember this okay this should suffice it is that that there is that sociology of law within sociology of law uh, they are essentially concerned about law as a way of you know controlling regulating human conduct okay uh, unlike this sociological jurisprudence is what jurists in fact do okay this are these are not social scientists scientists studying you know law but these are jurists okay who were not mm, what should i say you know satisfied with the legal questions okay answers to which have already been discussed okay in the other three different schools so they had their they have their own reasons and justifications for developing this particular school of jurisprudence known as sociological jurisprudence so what you will you know, see in this particular you know, school of jurisprudence is that um, this is one of the more you know progressive schools of jurisprudence, which is concerned more with the society, okay, and then merely with you know what had been in fashion until then, that is individual rights, okay. So, and, uh, so you will see that this school focuses on those aspects as well, okay, the duties and the duties within the society. The, we do not live as isolated individual, you know, island-like individuals. We live in a community. We live in a society. So those duties have also to be looked at. Okay. So yes, um, this is uh, something that you will see. Uh, it is progressive in the sense that uh, it it tried to, uh, you know, shatter the grip of uh, traditional jurisprudence that we have studied. Okay. So the schools of jurisprudence that we have studied. Uh, so far when so for example uh, you had a uh, nature law school okay which essentially talked about certain you know higher order nature law principles and the relations uh, you know law has with respect to morality okay mm -hmm. so that's what we have studied okay in broadly generally in nature law school and then we took up another school known as legal positivism which has, you know, that also had, uh, had its own criticism of nature law school that you remember we have discussed earlier. Uh, but uh, their essential idea is conceptual analysis of, you know, law. So their central, you know, inquiry is what is law. They call themselves legal scientists, as you have seen. But And then there are two different, you know, broad, you know, categorizations that we can make among them. One is the fact positivist, the other one are the normative positivists. And then you see that the British jurists are uh, empiricists, whereas uh, the ones of Germanic or uh, Austrian in origin are of uh, are um, 
they, their ideas are based on what we discussed known as transcendental idealism, especially in the works of uh, Hans Kelsen. But even then, legal positivism also seemed to be a barren analysis of legal concepts, okay? It does not actually discuss about what goes on in the society, whether there is any relation between the concepts that we are discussing and the society in which, you know, the um, society in which those concepts exist, okay? Or do they exist in a different world on, of their own with no effects, uh, uh, you know, with, with reality having no effects on them? So you will see that these two jurisprudence, you know, schools of jurisprudence that we have already discussed were not, you know, uh, you know, sufficient in answering certain other questions that concerned certain jurists. And hence, uh, they came up with this school of jurisprudence known as sociological jurisprudence. Apart from that, you also had a historical school of jurisprudence. The problem with that school, just uh, um, cursory introduction, okay, is that uh, they were concerned more with the past than with what is to be done for the future. So, yeah, that is also not sufficient. So, you have sociological jurisprudence. So, you see the sociological jurisprudence emerging in the 19th century, to be more precise, okay, with a particular, you know, change in uh, understanding uh, of political, you know, changes in the political ideologies as well, okay. So, in the 19th century, you sh see a shift from individual rights to social duties that until then, based on all their natural rights principles, etc., etc., which talked only in the language of individual rights, okay. Now, you see that, well, that's not enough because we do not live like, you know, isolated individuals, okay. We live in a community, so there are certain duties that we owe, okay, within the society uh, that we are part of. So, you see there's a shift from this broad idea of individual rights to that of social duties, okay, and communal existence mm, so and uh, why did that happen okay i told you that this is a changing you know mm, you know understanding uh, you know in, in within this broader discourse on political ideologies okay and why did that happen you see that well uh, industrialization was going on okay there was growth of pop, uh, population uh, you had um, machines uh, etc okay, industrialization happened happened industrial revolution happened okay now in this changed world in this changed you know context okay merely talks in terms of individual rights were not sufficient or you could say that individual were rights existed so as to protect uh, you know those who had the means okay but those who didn't have it okay um, so you see Marxism uh, you know, emerging during that period, okay? So they were talking in terms of the others who do not have it, okay? So individual rights were essentially protecting the property classes. It was um, uh, protecting the elites, okay? But it wasn't, it was ignoring the others, okay? Uh, the, um, the rest of us who, who are there. So yes, you, you see that there was a shift in our um, you know, political ideology as it, you know, uh, you know, evolved during that period of time. The shift is from that of individual rights to that of social duties. Along with that, newer and newer matters also, you know, you know, came into prominence, okay? Okay, so govern now state started concerning itself, okay, with not just the limited, you know, function that it had, for example, tax, you know, collection of tax, tax, and uh, defense etc not just that now it started becoming much more elaborate and it had much more effect and influence in our lives for example in terms of our health in terms of welfare education economics okay so these became the new part of the state as it was evolving so these things okay if these are the areas in which the state is getting into then uh, then, then our ideas, then our legal concepts cannot be constrained only by this idea of individual rights, okay? There has to be something else that needs to be addressed as well. So, for example, welfare, in welfare state, you see that distribution of resources do happen, okay? How do we talk about that? Or is that not allowed because of our too much focus on individual rights, okay? So, these are the questions, okay? The ideas of social justice, okay? 
um, socioeconomic rights that we talk about now, these were emerging back then, okay, which were not addressed by the previous schools of jurisprudence, okay. So those were certain shortcomings of the previous schools of jurisprudence that they were not able to address these newer developments as were happening in the society. So, <clears throat> yes, uh, so this is something that, uh, you know, we are essentially going to study. So you will see that uh, uh, there are broadly two different reasons, okay, why this school of jurisprudence known as sociological school of jurisprudence had emerged, okay. One is that the other schools of jurisprudence had failed, okay, there were certain, certain flaws in them, okay. And then there was growth of new social and economic interests, okay, um, for all the reasons that we just discussed, okay. And it will make more sense if we discuss these reasons a little more, you know, thoroughly. So, as you, as you see that this uh, nature law school or what has been also known as the philosophical schools of jurisprudence, okay, they would talk in terms of... Uh, you know, certain principles, certain higher order ideals, okay, which they say are there, transcendent, you know, known to those who are willing to see it, who are able to rationalize to see it, okay, uh, seem to be very static, okay, they were not subject to change, okay, those ideas now in the changed circumstances for all these reasons that we just, you know, talked about, okay, seem to be uh, obscure, okay. So they were kind of obstacles in the path of social and legal progress. Same was the case with historical school because historical school concerned more with what was there in the glorified you know, past, okay, than what is to be done for the changing fast pace, you know, fast pace changing future. So these were some of the important flaws with both historical school as well as the philosophical school. You can also relate it with the natural law school. Some examples of the same would be no fault, you know, no liability unless fault. So until, you know, recently the idea was that one can be made liable only for, um, you know, you know, for the wrongs that they have done, okay, for the duties that they have, you know, breached, okay. But if you haven't breached any such, you know, legal duty that existed, okay, then there is no liability. But you know that in the changed, you know, situations, okay, it is no longer so, for example, in case of M.C. Mehta versus Union of India, so you see that the justification in all these cases, okay, uh, so you know that now the court has come up with this idea of um, absolute liability in which not even act of God, okay, would be an exception. So, even if you have no fault, okay, there will be liability. So, what would be these reasonings, you know, be, be uh, you know, be based on, and because it is not about false, it can't be about the harm principle. There has to be something else. So, what would that principle be? Uh, so, it need not be any specific nature law principle, but it could be some other kind of, you know, just there could be some other kind of justification. So, for example, the people who have suffered, okay, it's not their fault that they have suffered, whereas. The people, you know, the defendant for whom, due to whose, you know, act, okay, maybe even if it is not without, uh, or not not with fault, okay, but it is because of them, okay, certain act, acts that they have done that the, you know, plaintiffs have suffered, okay, although defendant had no fault, but they have the resources, they have the money, they have the substance, okay, to compensate to those who have suffered. So, for example, the defendant here, maybe they had a, you know, chemical, you know, factory. Okay, they were manufacturing something with the intention to do what? To make profit. Okay, so it was the, you know, something that they were doing to generate profit. So whether they were at fault or not, but ultimately others had to suffer. Okay, so in such situation, the justification here cannot be merely based on the principle of harm, but this based on the idea that, well, they are economically better off and are capable of, you know, compensating these people who have suffered. So you see, it's a different kind of reasoning here. So yes, that's why you see cases like Rylands versus Fletcher, and then you see cases like MC Mehta versus Union of India. 
apart from that some other cons you know ideas okay so for example uh, you know the idea of autonomy as you see in uh, uh, the philosophical natural law school okay talks about everyone having free will and then they enter into contracts so this entire idea of uh, contract is based on this principle of uh, that you shall you shall keep your promises okay so what we know as liberty of contract is not much you know about liberty why is that so you know that mm, you know in in contract the two parties are considered to be at equal pedestal and only then they are able to without any uh, any other extraneous you know influence considerations are able to enter into free you know agreement with you know each other but if one party is clearly at a disadvantaged position you know compared to the other then you cannot say that there's a case of free contract okay between them so for example there is a monopoly in the market okay and they are able to you know and for, um, you know they are the only employers and then for us they are the only source of employment okay so in such case i do not have much room to have any sort of negotiation with my prospective employer as to what i will be paid okay so can you say that we are on a same pedestal on an equal pedestal in which we can enter into free contract with you know each other it just does not happen okay so in such situation focusing on this idea of liberty of contract seems to be a kind of injustice in itself although it's based on certain other you know principles that natural law school or other schools talk about so yes um, uh, apart from that okay in today's times you see that workmen you know um, compensation on that uh, you have many different uh, insurance that the employers you know have to uh, you know get um, when they employ people okay so when people are employed in hazardous industries okay earlier the defense would be that well you voluntarily chose to be employed okay knowing that there are certain dangers involved in this kind of employment but now that's not the case okay even if someone entered into contract okay mm, uh, <clears throat> uh, for example with respect to some employment in which there are dangers involved okay but that is not reason enough for the employer say that well he will not be compensated okay so yes you see this changed understandings were not explained or accounted for by the uh, other schools of jurisprudence especially the historical or the natural law philosophical schools of jurisprudence so you need some other approaches to you know uh, account for these you know situations these cases so it has been said that the philosophical jurist okay centered their attention upon existing social and economic order so for example a particular class is property class they have more money the others do not okay so they did not concern about these these inequalities that existed okay they focused more on maintaining status quo so they centered their attention on existing social and economic order never thought in terms of bringing about social changes okay and they sought by virtue of reasoning to justify the continuance of the present status quo they do not want change they did not want change so yes uh, because of that you know those existing schools became uh, with the passes of time irrelevant uh, so yeah apart from that you have another school of jurisprudence known as analytical school of jurisprudence okay Uh, the analytical school of jurisprudence was too formalistic they were too conceptual okay and the flaw in that school had been that they thought that law exists the idea of law exists you know abstractly okay separate from the realities okay so they talk only in terms of concepts and then you see that this there is this difference that exists between what they say law is as it is and what the social reality is okay so that was the defect with analytical school especially the fact positivist what the fact positivist were uh, talking about so we have seen so far that for uh, analytical positivists okay they are concerned more with uh, clarity in law more with uniformity and you know predictability uh, in law and uh, they were not really concerned much about 
individuality of application okay of the laws that when the laws as they are in law books okay when they are applied in specific case without taking into account the specificities of the specific case okay then it leads to some kind of injustice and that's the fault that analytical positivists had okay so they ignored ignored the equity that could be done in specific cases okay so you see in england as well uh, the overly formalistic nature of uh, mm, common law led to the emergence of law of equity okay so that's the defect with uh, analytical jurisprudence that they are too formalistic okay they do not talk in terms of actual justice in specific cases because they focus too much on uniformity and predictability of you know laws so yes as a reaction to that um, you have other uh, schools of this school of jurisprudence more precisely coming into existence so examples of that would be for example the idea of human you know being as free moral agent and could freely enter into contract as we just discussed okay these are some con these are some conceptual ideas that you find in analytical jurisprudence that we are going to discuss those concepts later on in the juris in juris 2 so these things okay made the law very static okay and social reality was changing and they were not able to address uh, the changing social circumstances so yes you needed another school of jurisprudence and sociological jurisprudence was there to fill in that uh, gap now uh, apart from this you see during this time in the 19th century you see the debate okay mm -hmm. for example uh, Sevigny's opposition to uh, codification of law so you see there was a uh, clash between what is known as the um, imperative school of jurisprudence that is law as a command of sovereign especially in Austinian work versus uh, historical uh, you know school so this was this um, this clash that happened okay this disagreement that happened between uh, uh, um, positive school on the one hand and uh, historical school on the other you know, especially in the works of Sevigny, who did not like the idea of Germany having codified law, this debate was not you know, healthy for legal progress during that time. So to address that, a new way of looking at law had emerged, and that's what your sociological jurisprudence is essentially about. Apart from that, the changed conditions, the industrial and, uh, you know, socially, you know, changing you know, uh, you know, society, okay, it created pressure for certain new needs, okay, which had, you know, emerged because of this changed social circumstances. Those new needs were not addressed by the um, existing, you know, laws, okay, which the existing jurisprudence only justified. So this is something that is very important. So you see the struggle in the American Supreme Court in the um, uh, later half of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so for example, uh, the idea of uh, employment, okay, so you see that many, uh, some of the states, okay, states came up with laws. So for example, Lochner versus New York being such a case, okay, that states come up with laws to restrict the number of hours for which someone can be employed, okay? In this particular case, I think women could be employed in bake shop, okay? Which was challenged in the Supreme Court saying that, well, it's against the idea of liberty of contract, okay? So, in the name of liberty of contract, people were being exploited, okay? By making them work for long hours, okay? So, these things were not looked into uh, or not addressed by the existing schools of jurisprudence. So yes, these are the things which have been addressed by a new way of thinking, okay? That is what sociological jurisprudence is all about. So there was a kind of ignorance of de facto social and economic upheaval which was going through, going in the, happening in the society, okay? Uh, and those uh, changes were not noticed by the uh, you know, existing schools of jurisprudence and those changes okay uh, were addressed by the sociological uh, schools of jurisprudence now what is this sociological school of jurisprudence do they have any uh, central ideas and central principle that these jurists believe in 
okay well we cannot homogenize all of them they all have different ways of you know philosophizing but some prominent names that you must know are for example Roscoe Pound okay he's a very famous sociological jurist that we are going to study then you have uh, Louis Brandy okay then you have uh, Leon Dujuy okay then you have Eugene Ehrlich so these are some of the prominent names in you know within sociological jurisprudence and not all of them would be studied but Roscoe Pound is important for us so we will definitely study his ideas uh, very soon now you will see that there are certain commonalities in in their approaches okay and you can say that those are broadly the doctrines of sociological school of jurisprudence okay so what are those um one is that we were until then talking in terms of rights okay but what are rights you see that rights were justified in terms of some natural law school okay idea that they're you know given by god or they you can find them in some kind of first principle that they are uh, they, if they exist then government has no justification in meddling with them so these were kind of absolutist idea of rights that existed you know before sociological school of jurisprudence and they were highly individualized okay that if I have a right there can be no superseding reason for my right to be cut or compromised in any way whatsoever okay but such an approach was not healthy okay it wasn't it was very problematic as i said to you that they were maintaining the established social and uh, socio political and economic order so yes uh, we have to address that okay so the sociological school of jurisprudence was trying to address that that problem okay so they recognized that behind legal rights so when we talk about legal rights there exist certain interests okay there exist certain interests okay could be social interest or it could be individual individual interest it could be collective interest okay we're going to discuss in Roscoe Baum's work very soon okay so whenever law recognizes a right what we know as legal rights okay it recognizes some of this interest okay and then they turn it into legal rights so there is no nothing you know special about legal rights which cannot be you know dissected and then uh, you know looked into so sociological jurists say that well you can dissect and then when you dissect you see that there are certain interests which are being recognized okay so they say that to identify um, uh, they, they, okay so they say that we identify the, the this legal rights okay so um, when we identify those legal rights then you will see that those legal rights are not to be understood only in terms of concepts as positivist uh, or formalists we're talking about okay we'll see that there's a reality behind those you know legal rights and that reality is that there are different kinds of interests social individual or collective and what is what is recognized is some kind of a compromise or some kind of reconciliation of all these different kinds of interests so yes apart from that along with this idea of right there was another idea that where there is a right okay uh, there are certain existing remedies okay so if there was no remedy given by the law okay there was no legal right okay so sociological school of jurisprudence would not have that okay so they say that it should be otherwise okay it should not be if there was a uh, you know there was no remedy given by law there was no legal right okay so they say that this abstract idea of right is to be given up okay don't focus too much on the rights okay uh, focus on what you know lies beneath it okay so they say that dissect it dissect the idea of rights and see what's there another important uh, you know uh, you know doctrine that uh, sociological school okay believe in is that is a re-examination of this inherited premises of old law as we have seen okay which may not function in the changed world of today that there is something that the old law or old, old way of understanding law talks about and the world is changing for many reasons that we discussed just now okay so they, they may not function in those you know change in that changing world of today okay so some of those ideas are for example the due process okay you see the idea of due process has changed a lot okay 
within Indian jurisprudence, you see the idea of uh, due process has changed a lot as well. So, and then apart from that, the idea of reasonable man, which has historically been about reasonable man, it would include, exclude the idea of woman, okay? So, yeah, that thing has also changed, okay? Apart from that, uh, uh, this gender neutrality in the idea of reasonable men, the idea of reasonability itself has changed, okay? Or at least we have recognized that, well, the idea of reason reasonableness that we had taken for granted for so long is not that reasonable, okay? So, yes, this new changing, okay, situations necessitated that we also changed our understanding of all these ideas, okay? Due process, reasonable men, etc., etc. Okay, so similarly, you had this idea of absolute right to hold and dispose and use your property. So if you had property, it would mean that you can do whatever you want to. But you know that in today's time, you have so many issues. Okay, so for example, climate change being one. So just because, you know, I have this property does not mean that I can create, uh, you know, do something which is environmentally uh, uh, unfriendly. So governments do impose restrictions on individuals' absolute right. This is something which will not be allowed by the old schools, okay? Something which has been accounted for by the sociological school of jurisprudence. And even, forget about uh, environment, which is very easily understood. If you're in the cities, in the municipality areas, you see that lots of regulations are imposed at what height your buildings will be, what color you can fly, okay? Those things are also necessary, but one, 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 cannot, one can say that, well, these are matters of my individual rights and they have no business telling me how high I should build and what color I should apply. That's clearly not the case. Okay, so that's the idea. If you think only in terms of concepts, then how do you account for this? Okay, so you see that it's not just about individual rights, it's also about something, you know, the collectivity. So yes, the idea of absolute user and disposition of property is uh, whittled down to a great extent. Okay, then we already discussed about no liability unless what, which has been changed by the idea of absolute liability in uh, Rylands versus Fletcher, and then uh, strict liability in Rylands versus Fletcher, and then absolute liability in the case of MC Mehta versus Union of India. So yes, mm, and then. Earlier you had this idea of states having no liability under the tort, okay, but now you see your Kasturi Lal's case being one such case, but you see there is an increasing trend in making the states liable, okay, for uh, uh, even in case of tort. Uh, apart from that, uh, there are examples of delegation of powers to administrative tribunals, okay, so so many things are there, okay, there is also change in changes in theories of punishment, okay. So these, all these changes will not be accounted for, okay, if you do not look at the progress, the changes, okay, in the society which are happening. We cannot be stuck with our traditional, you know, ideas, with our traditional, if, if we are not to stick to our traditional ways of being, nor can we, nor should we stick to our traditional ways of legal thinking. So those changes, those progressive changes, uh, could be seen in the uh, you know works of sociological in, in sociological jurisprudence. So that's there, and then the third important doctrine with respect to sociological jurisprudence is that uh, is the sociological study as a preparation for law making. Okay, whether it for it is for the judges or also for the uh, legislator. Okay, so obviously legislators do take into consideration, you know, um, sociological studies that happen, okay? So, what those um, different kinds of studies which are done by social scientists, sociologists more specifically, those are definitely taken into consideration by the legislators while lawmaking. So, for example, if you are going to reduce crime in a certain place, you have to also understand the root causes of crime in a certain place. Disciplines like sociology has a lot to, uh, you know, say about all these matters. So if you are a legislator, it makes more sense for you to consult all these you know, experts, all these studies which are done, okay, and then make laws accordingly. The problem is not as much with the legislators as much it is in it is with that of the judges. The problem arises when judges, you know, make law. But it is said by sociological school uh, of jurists that, uh, well, 
even judges uh, you know should take into consideration all these you know factors even they should prepare okay um, when when they give their judgment their decisions it has to be based on some kind of sociological study okay so yeah so that's something that others would disagree but this is what so the sociological school of jurists and uh, jurists were right, talking about they say that if you do not take into consideration all this then you will be doing some other kind of injustice uh, you know by being too formalistic about law so the idea is to enable and compel law making uh, and also interpretation and application of legal rules to take more account and more intelligent account of social facts okay so that's the idea so it is they are concerned about how to make law more effective they are not concerned about merely about validity of law as the uh, you know legal positivists have been they are concerned more about how to make the law more effective and uh, then you have uh, this question of equitable solution to controversies in specific cases okay among the you know parties okay so the other schools were concerned about concepts about higher principles about um, uh, you know uh, formal you know formal nature of law this this school of jurisprudence is concerned more about doing justice in instant cases okay so they they focus less on the idea of predictability and for Uh, you know certainty but more about doing justice in instant cases okay so that's that's why they focus more on equitable solutions to controversies in concrete cases okay so instead of development of law abstractly or uniformly as the formalists would do okay uh, this what they do is what they are concerned about how the um, actual adjudication can do justice in instant cases as they come before the judges so yes um, for them what ultimately matters is the idea of public interest obviously they do not say that individual interests you know do not exist they do matter but they are not the end okay there is also a larger public interest okay so you will not let someone pollute you know to as much as they want in the name of individual rights okay at the cost of the interest of others okay so that's essentially what this school was uh, you know talking about and that way this school is progressive progressivist it is based on social facts okay so yes uh, this is very important okay in india as well you will see that there are many cases in which you know sociological school jurisprudence you know did you know play a part um, especially in judgments relating to reservation Uh, uh you know relating to uh, property in which case you will see that yeah initially it was little um you know more conservative because their judgment, supreme court judgment had been initially against the distribution of property which was brought up uh, which the legislature was trying to bring about so yes we will discuss all that um uh, in the next class we'll take a few cases and that will uh give you examples of case uh, situations in which our very own judges have uh, have you know themselves you know been inspired by this ideas of sociological jurisprudence and have also applied the same in the specific judgments so we'll discuss that and then rosco pound in the subsequent classes so that should be uh, enough for today